Well, on this fourth program in our series of our island heritage, we've moved outside and we're going to look at some of the ancient monuments that can be found around the island. And we welcome back to the series uh, Mr. Marshall Coven, who as well as being director of the Manx Museum and National Trust, is also inspector of the ancient monuments. Mr. Coven, welcome again to the series. Mm, good afternoon. Um, could we ask you, first of all, you know, we're talking about ancient monuments. They're spread all over the island of various sizes and, I suppose, of importance. But w what about the, the, the first one that was found? How did it come about? Uh, well, I don't know that I can really answer the <laughs> question, how, how, what the first one that was found. Um, some of them, of course, are quite conspicuous features of the, of the landscape with great stones sticking up out of the ground and so on, and they must have been known um, throughout the time that's gone by since their original construction. Um, I suppose uh, scientific study of the monuments, um, in the island at least, uh, doesn't go further back than the 19th century. And uh, truth to tell, quite a lot of the 19th century work uh, could hardly justify the word scientific. It was, <laughs> it was a little bit um, amateurish, or so, so we regard it today. But, but I dare say that perhaps in another hundred years' time, uh, the archaeologists of the 21st century may be describing our work as amateurish <laughs> too. <laughs> Um, but uh, it, towards the end of the, uh, of the last century, an increasingly um, uh, careful and scholarly and scientific approach um, was being shown. Um, I suppose some of the earliest uh, really important scientific excavations carried out in the Isle of Man were done by uh, F.W. Swinnerton at, um, at Port St. Mary and um, also at Glen Willen, uh, working on uh, Mesolithic sites. But then uh, the outstanding name in terms of early Manx archaeology uh, is that of PMC Kermode. Kermode was uh, the first curator of the Manx Museum. He was quite an old man when he uh, when the museum was established and he became the first curator, but he'd been campaigning virtually all his life. He was a pioneer. And it's rather nice to think that he not only lived long enough to see his dream of a National Museum of the island uh, come true, but he actually was the first curator and so was able to get it off on very much on the right foot, yeah. a splendidly scholarly foot it was too. And Kermode himself did a lot of excellent field work, um, especially in regard to the early Christian remains of the island, the uh, the keels, the little early Christian chapels and burial sites up and down the island. Uh, Kermode uh, was really the principal uh, excavator of sites of that type. Certain sites were excavated by other people and, and uh, some notable ones, but uh, Kermode, uh, Kermode is the name that really dominates the study of the early Christian remains, both the, the keels and also the cross slabs. I noticed when we were going around the museum on previous programs that uh, you had a lot of aerial photography or photographs you were taken from from an aeroplane. Has this been a big help in the location and work, the, the, the fa aerial photography? Oh yes, indeed, it, indeed it has. Aerial photography is one of one of many sort of scientific techniques that have been applied to field archaeology in in the last um, uh, twenty or thirty years. Um, archaeology is, is, is becoming more and more of uh, a scientific study, of course. Um, petrology, the actual study of the, of the type of stone of which stone axe heads is made. This is just another example of, of uh, uh, the archaeologist and the, and the scientist getting together and um, uh, advancing scholarship as, as a result. Obviously, um, you know, when you go to start an excavation, great care has got to be taken. It must be done very slowly because damage, irreparable damage, could be done uh, with, with speed, perhaps. Um, perhaps quite briefly before we go on to the monuments, you could uh, tell us how you actually start an excavation where you think there may be something. 
Uh, well, it's a fair enough question, but it's not a very easy one to answer. Uh, it depends, of course, so much on the type of, of monument that, that you're dealing with. Uh, the, the sort of approach can vary uh, um, dependent on the, the nature of, of the monument. If you're digging a burial mound, it's a different proposition from digging, say, a hill fort that might extend over a fairly ex quite extensive area. Um, the essential thing is is uh, extreme care and skill. It, it is, I perhaps should stress, that in the Isle of Man, um, archaeological excavation can only be done under license from the Manx Museum. Um, it has to be remembered, I think, that excavation by its very nature is destruction. If you excavate a site, you destroy the evidence forever and uh, therefore it's really only justifiable uh, when it's being carried out under properly qualified direction and when every stage of the excavation is carefully recorded both in terms of maps and sections and photographs um, so that it is possible to in effect reconstruct the site on paper after the excavation is completed um, it, it's a long and careful task. It is. Uh, uh, it, I'm afraid there is a um, quite misleading um, romantic appeal about field archaeology. Mm. Uh, you generally kind of picture uh, merrily putting a spade into the ground and turning up treasure and whatnot. <laughs> but I'm afraid most uh, most excavation is just the reverse of that. It's it's very um, it's painfully <laughs> slow, and you have to be very patient. And particularly in 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 a Celtic area of the West of Britain, such as the Isle of Man, um, finds are going to be very limited. <laughs> Mm. And um, furthermore, I think uh, the point that, again, the amateur doesn't uh, always see, um, what is more important than the actual finds that are recovered um, is the relationship of the finds within the layers of soil in the ground. You really have to learn the technique of excavation so that you can read the soil layers. It's almost like learning a, another method of reading. And this is the kind of thing that unskilled excavation, of course, um, runs the risk of, of great loss and, uh, of, of knowledge because these sort of features simply won't be recognized uh, by a person uh, who hasn't had the appropriate experience. Well, there are a terrific number of ancient monuments around the island, as I said, all varying in size and possibly of importance. We're going to try and uh, look and talk about some of the uh, perhaps more famous ones, and uh, obviously great care has been taken with these, and I think the Castellinard, I think I've got that correct, that's uh, possibly the one we want to talk about first as we're here looking at it. Yes, that's right. Cashelnard in, in, in Merkold um, is, I suppose, perhaps the most impressive field monument in, in the Isle of Man. It's, it's, it's rather difficult to get at. It's uh, uh, well away from the main road. Um, during the summer months, uh, through the good offices of the highway board, we have a series of signposts erected that will uh, show anyone the way. Uh, briefly you turn down onto the Renab Road at, at, at Mackled and then you uh, uh, turn uh, to the east and on the top of this low hill uh, near to the copse of fir trees um, there is this impressive site with these enormous stones uh, standing up the highest of them is over eight feet high it dwarfs a human figure yeah. and uh, it is the remains of a very impressive monument of the New Stone Age, dating from, say, about 2500 BC. This, I think, we saw in the a model of this, didn't we, in the first program we did in the museum, which is one of the first records of burials. Yes, that, yes, that, that's true. It's, uh, it's a famous site, well known outside the Isle of Man, in, in archaeological circles. It is, of course, only a skeleton of what was originally there. The, um, the, the surviving stones just show us the outline um, there is a long central uh, line of burial chambers um, and uh, that is approached through this archway of natural stone 
uh, from a semicircular forecourt area. Uh, you see the forecourt is flanked by these very large standing stones. Now, originally, um, extending back from the forecourt, there would have been a long cairn of stones and soil and rubble that would have completely enclosed the burial chamber, so that the burial chamber would have been like a, a sort of artificial cave approached from the forecourt and going back into the, the centre of the cairn. Now, over the centuries, long before there was a Manx Museum organization to protect the ancient monuments of the island, uh, the cairn material has been uh, robbed away. Doubtless, a lot of the field walls that we see around us have been built from material taken from the cairn. Yes. And so the burial chamber, or the side stones of the burial chamber, are now exposed uh, to the sky but that wouldn't have been their original uh, um, state, of course. They were enclosed within the cairn. And then uh, in the forecourt area, doubtless, uh, if you're romantically inclined, you can picture rituals going on and so on associated with, with the burials that took place in the, in the chamber. Mm -hmm. This was a, um, a communal burial site that was used repeatedly, rather after the manner of a, a family vault. And it probably was used only by the uh, um, the well-to-do, perhaps the chieftain's family or whatever of uh, New Stone Age society. Of course, we have no written records going back that far, so we don't know the details. We we can't put a name on any of the people buried in the, in the site or anything of that kind. But obviously, it was a site of great importance. Uh, an enormous amount of labour uh, has gone into the construction of a monument of this size, and um, it clearly had very great significance for the people who built it. Yes. Before we move on to take a look at the next site, you, you, you mentioned one point there which I'd like to bring out, and that is that these sites now are protected, aren't they? Uh, yes, th that's right. Under the terms of the Manx Museum and National Trust Acts, as they are now, there is um, a protection machinery operated by the Manx Museum trustees um, in respect of all, at least all the scheduled monuments in the island. And many uh, owners of ancient monuments have appointed the museum trustees as the guardians of the monument. Well, we've now moved to the south of the island, above Craignish, and the particular monument now Mr. Coburn is going to tell us about is the, the Mull Circle. Yes, well, this is another splendidly sited monument, like Cashelanard. It's um, up on uh, the top or near the top of the hill here. These megalithic tombs, as they're sometimes called because they're constructed of large stones, um, you, you find all of them on the coastal plateau land, perhaps about four or five hundred feet above sea level. You don't get them down on the lowlands, you don't, you don't get them right up in the, in the middle of the hills. And uh, the Mull Circle here has got a splendidly commanding view, as you see, looking down over Port Erin, and it's very typical of these uh, New Stone Age uh, burial sites. This is really part of the same story as Cash Lenard, except that it is, a, it's, it is a truly unique monument. There's no other known anywhere in, in, in the world, um, in that the burial chambers here are arranged in the form of a circle. Cash Lenard is, is a type of monument that's fairly widespread in Western Britain and even further afield, but the Mole Circle is, as I say, uh, unique with this very interesting arrangement of burial chambers arranged in pairs, each pair approached by a little entrance passageway and uh, the pairs of chambers arranged in, in a circle. Um, and um, this was excavated by Kermit and Herdman at the end of the last century and then again early in this century and a few years ago um, Miss Audrey Henschel from Edinburgh did a limited further excavation here and um, the site must date from late New Stone Age times, perhaps um, 2000 to 1800 BC. Pottery and uh, jet beads were found, as well as cremation burial. Well, before we talk about this next ancient monument that uh, we're going to look at, um, can I ask you, do you welcome uh, members of the public actually going to look at these monuments? Oh yes, uh, from the museum's point of view, most certainly. we, we um, we like to, to encourage it. Um, the more people who are interested in, in uh, the subject, uh, the happier we are. 
And in fact, the museum has um, published a little handbook called The Ancient and Historic Monuments of the Isle of Man, which gives a selection of monuments and brief directions of how to, how to get there. Uh, there's just one point I, I wish, must stress, though, in this connection, and that is that um, where these monuments are on private land, uh, of course, visitors uh, must check with the, the landowner, the, the farmer, to make sure that he's happy for them uh, to go. There isn't an automatic public right of access. Um, uh, my experience is that the, the Manx farmers are most helpful and most cooperative to anyone who is acting in a responsible way. I mean, obviously, one must close gates behind you and that sort of thing. Uh, but um, it, it's it's very exceptional, I, I think, for there to be difficulty in that direction. But um, I just must make it clear there isn't an automatic legal right. Well, there's certainly no problem in reaching this particular one, the giant's grave at St. John's, because it's uh, just about alongside the road, isn't it? Well, that, that's true. This is one of the, the easy ones. You can do it from your, from your, your, without getting out of your car, literally. <laughs> uh, it's on the little back road, of course, that goes down behind Tinwald Hill, uh, down towards uh, Moors Mills, as they're still known. Um, and it, it is literally... Uh, in the roadside, uh, the site was actually um, uncovered in 1848, I think was the date, when the road was being made or when it was being widened at this point. And in the roadworks, this great stone kist, as it's called, a great stone grave, was exposed in the roadside. And if you look above it, you can see the uh, curve of what was originally the burial mound that was erected over the top of the grave. It is a Bronze Age grave of uh, perhaps about a thousand BC in, in round figures, and uh, even, or even a little bit earlier than that. Um, it's rather in the megalithic tradition, using these very big stones. Um, the megalithic tombs that we've been talking about before were built by the earlier New Stone Age people, but it looks as if some of their um, ideas um, uh, were taken up by the new Bronze Age settlers. But the big difference is that instead of thinking of a communal burial uh, place that would be used repeatedly, uh, here in the Bronze Age, we are dealing with individual burials. Uh, you get a single burial. Sometimes you get secondary graves inserted into the edges of um, a Bronze Age burial mound. But in each case, it is um, an individual separate grave that, that is constructed. Well, in our first program uh, in this series, we mentioned the Viking burial uh, uh, site at Balladool. That's where we are now, but I know it's much more than just Viking, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed. Chapel Hill Balladool, uh, I suppose, is probably the richest archaeological site in, in the island uh, in terms of different periods of occupation, at least. Um, it might be argued that it's got almost... Uh, uh, well, not quite all Manx archaeology <laughs> represented here, but 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 a, but a lot of it. Uh, we've had Middle Stone Age flints, we've had New Stone Age flints. Uh, there is over there to the north um, a Bronze Age, an early Bronze Age grave, and then you see the top of the low hill here is completely enclosed by this earthen bank. Um, this is the outer rampart of a Celtic Iron Age hill fort and uh, then it while the hill fort was being excavated uh, during the last war um, the quite unexpectedly uh, dr Burso came across a um, viking pagan viking ship burial and in fact underneath the the ship burial, un directly under the keel of the Viking boat, there was a pre-Viking early Christian cemetery. So it's a very rich site indeed yeah. in terms of, of archaeology. Is there any particular reason you think why this should be one site with so much? Um, well, it does stand out, uh, of course, as, as, as a low hill rising out of this rich uh, agricultural lowland that forms the southeast of the Isle of Man. And um, 
possibly because of the enclosure it, it um, has escaped ploughing and um, in, in consequence um, uh, a lot has, has survived here. Uh, there probably are, I'm sure there are other, other sites uh, with uh, similar concentrations, but few that have got quite as much on, on such a small compass. Uh, the the positioning near to the sea, you see the, the Bay Nakaraki is just about a quarter of a mile away there to the southwest. Um, this is absolutely classic sighting for a Viking burial, a pagan Viking burial, on the top of a low hill uh, within view of the coast. That's just where you expect the Vikings to be. Um, and uh, probably they were choosing their site so that the burial mound would stand up, would be viewed visible from the sea, and would act as a memorial to, to the dead warrior, so that his, his um, friends sailing past in their Viking ships uh, would see the, the mound and say, there's the grave of good old Olaf, remember the good times we had raiding into France and all the rest of it. Yes. Well, that's the site here, and if we just turn around now from Balladul, of course, we can see South Barul. Uh, we're not sort of keen on climbing up there to have a look. I think we could perhaps discuss it from here. Uh, well, that's the lazy way to do it, really. You should go right up to the top. Um, the, the, the summit of South Barul, of course, which is the, the highest point in the southern part of the island, the southern hills, 1585 feet above sea level, uh, the summit of South Barul is also occupied by the ramparts of a Celtic hill fort. Uh, really a very much more massive affair than uh, the one that we're on here at uh, Balladool. Um, it was the largest hill fort by far in, in the Isle of Man. Um, it uh, had um, two periods, at least two periods of, of uh, construction. There was an inner rampart which uh, appears to have been robbed uh, and uh, a much larger outer rampart constructed. In other words, the fort was, was extended in size. Um, and this is one of the sites where aerial photography be, has been of great help to us. Uh, under the right conditions, um, uh, aerial photographs show an absolute honeycomb of hut circles within the inner rampart of South Peru. Over 80 hut circles uh, up there on, on the top of Peru. And some excavation has been carried out here by Mr. Peter Gelling, a uh, Manxman of, at, uh, of Birmingham University, who's done a lot of archaeological excavation in the Isle of Man over the last 20-25 uh, years. Uh, Peter Gelling uh, dug three seasons at uh, South Peru. He sectioned both the ramparts and um, excavated an, a number of the huts. And uh, from one of the huts, he was able to obtain charcoal from the hearth in the center of the hut. And from this, it, it has been possible to get a radiocarbon date, which in fact uh, dates the, this occupation to about the 5th century BC. A very, perhaps very late Bronze Age, very early Iron Age, uh, that kind of period. Well, as I said earlier, there are many, many other ancient uh, memorials, ar monuments around the island. We've now come back to the Manx Museum, where they have a very fascinating map, and uh, it automatically lights up, showing the positions of these monuments. Um, the time is really going very fast in this program, Mr. Coburn. Perhaps uh, you'd like to mention perhaps just a few more of the, the more important ones. Yes, well, very briefly, I, I would mention the uh, site called Quanknumerio, which is just to the north of Port Grenick. If you drive down to the beach at Port Grenick and walk up the cliff path about a couple of hundred yards, uh, you come to this splendid site on the cliff top. Uh, it's a little defended promontory. Uh, it was excavated again by, by Peter Gelling um, in the 1950s, and uh, within the defended area there is the outline of a Viking period house. Viking house on the on the cliff top there. The site was actually in existence in the earlier Iron Age as well, uh, but that's a site well worth seeing. And similarly, uh, the site near the Braid, um, uh, just to the east of the Braid crossroads, 
um, there is a, a very interesting uh, site which has got a circular Celtic roundhouse outlined in stone here, not like timber as we talked about in the earlier program, um, and adjoining that a Viking period house um, and also either another Viking house or as I suspect perhaps uh, more likely um, a byre, a, a, a cattle shed of, of the Viking period. What we seem to have here is a Celtic farmstead that was actually taken over at the time of the Viking occupation and uh, no self-respecting Viking was going to <laughs> live in a house that was round and so he built himself a, a rectangular one of the sort that he would regard as normal and perhaps the, the round house survived for the Celts who mm. worked for him. And if we're talking about the Vikings, well, we're on then into uh, within the Christian period and, and uh, crosses I've already talked about in, in within the museum. But um, some of the great collections of crosses at the, their respective parish churches are well worth visiting for the for the Celtic crosses in particular, the, that's the pre-Viking ones, uh, Machold is outstanding. This was the site of the principal Celtic monastery of the island uh, long before Russian Abbey was, was established. And uh, this is the greatest concentration of the pre-Norse crosses. There are some interesting Norse crosses there as well, but for pre-Norse crosses, uh, Machold is, is supreme. Uh, for the later Norse crosses, with their splendid um, animal ornament and uh, scenes from the Norse mythology and so on, uh, there are a number of very good uh, parish collections, especially in the north of the island. Andreas and Jerby and Michael all have fine collections. Old Kirk Braddon Church, too, outside Douglas, that has another fine collection of, of Norse cross slabs. I think um, one ancient monument we must talk about just before we close down the programme, and that, of course, is perhaps the most famous worldwidely known at Tinwald Hill. Yes, Tinwald Hill indeed is is uh, an interesting monument and, and uh, a monument that's, uh, as it were, still still functioning. Yeah. Um, the tradition of Tinwald Hill being formed from soil, from all the parishes or sheetings or whatever of the island um, is, is a, a very widely held one. And uh, although there's no sort of documentary proof, uh, I think probably it is a tradition based on fact, because uh, uh, Bursa's excavations at Balatir indicated that the Viking mound had been formed of sods from all his fields. Mm -hmm. And uh, there may indeed be an echo of the same thought in the construction of Tinwald Hill from soil from all the different parts of the island. Um, the, the hill looks, uh, to my eye, perhaps a little bit too neat and tidy now. It's too perfectly so circular to be true, and uh, I think it's been improved over the centuries. I'm inclined to think that perhaps back in Viking times it wasn't uh, quite as mathematically uh, perfect as it is today. Well, Mr. Cobham, once again, thank you indeed for your help on the, the programme, and uh, I'm sure we'd like to remind our listeners once again that the Manx Museum, a wealth of history of our own island, is open daily uh, throughout the winter, and the hours, I think, are between 10 and 5, ten is that and correct? Five. 10 and 5 every weekday, yes. And uh, we hope to be talking to you again soon on the programme next week. Ne next month, I should say. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>